In 2020, Ridgefield youngsters are back to their studies, using technology that would have been inconceivable when young Samuel G. Goodrich, born in 1793, began his formal education at the Westlane School. The changes in education would amaze another distinguished alumnus of the Westlane School, Cyrus Northrup, born in 1834. Like Goodrich, he was an educator whose work affected many scholars over the years. Goodrich is best known by his nom de plume, Peter Parley, and his former school is now widely known by that name as well. Welcome to the Peter Parley Schoolhouse, a Ridgefield treasure, first restored by the Ridgefield Garden Club and now maintained by the Ridgefield Historical Society. Jack Sanders, one of the caretakers of the schoolhouse, a historian and the author of several books of Ridgefield history, will talk about these two men who each went from this school to renown in education. He'll also share portions of their memoirs that describe what it was like to be a student here. Hi. We're going to read a couple of passages from people who went to the West Lane Schoolhouse two or more centuries ago. And uh, both of these people were pretty illustrious and neither of them thought very highly of the West Lane School <laughs> or the schoolhouse, which was a little more than a shed back in the uh, 19th century. First person we're going to hear from is Samuel G. Goodrich, better known as Peter Parley, and the fellow who some people name this school after, they call it the Peter Parley Schoolhouse because Peter Parley went here. Who was Peter Parley? Well, he was a pen name for Goodrich uh, who wrote more than 100 books or commissioned uh, more than 100 books under the name of Peter Parley or his, some of them under his own name. Many were school books. And many of those school books were inspired by the awful time that he had at the West Lane Schoolhouse. He decided that school could be more interesting and the books that kids used in school could be a lot more interesting. And he decided to use a technique of storytelling. And he created this person called Peter Parley, who told stories about geography and history and science. It was very uh, innovative for its time and hundreds of thousands of Peter Parley books were sold in the 19th century and uh, were used in practically every schoolhouse in the United States and many in Great Britain. So let's see what uh, Samuel Goodrich had to say about the West Lane Schoolhouse, writing in 1856. About three-fourths of a mile from my father's house, which was on High Ridge, on the winding road to Lower Salem, which bore the name of West Lane, was the schoolhouse where I took my first lessons and received the foundations of my very slender education. The site of the schoolhouse was a triangular piece of land measuring perhaps a rood in extent and lying, according to the custom of those days, at the meeting of four roads. The ground hereabouts, as everywhere else in Ridgefield, was exceedingly stony and in making the pathway, the stones had been thrown out right and left, and there remained in heaps on either side from generation to generation. All around was bleak and desolate. Loose, squat stone walls with innumerable breaches enclosed the adjacent fields. A few tufts of elder, with here and there a patch of briars and pokeweed, flourished in the gravelly soil. Not a tree, however, remained, save an aged chestnut, 
at the western angle of the space. The schoolhouse itself consisted of rough, unpainted clapboards upon a wooden frame. It was plastered within and contained two apartments, a little entry taken out of a corner for a wardrobe, and the schoolroom proper. The chimney was of stone and pointed with mortar, which, by the way, had been dug into a honeycomb by uneasy and enterprising pen knives. The fireplace was six feet wide and four feet deep. The flue was so ample and so perpendicular that the rain, sleet, and snow fell directly to the hearth. I was about six years old when I first went to school. My teacher was Aunt Delight, that is, Delight Benedict, a maiden lady of 50, short and bent, of sallow complexion and solemn aspect. I remember the first day with perfect distinctness. I went alone, for I was familiar with the road, it being that which passed our old house. I carried a little basket with bread and butter within for my dinner, the same being covered over with a white cloth. I think we had 17 scholars, boys and girls mostly my own age. The school being organized, we were all seated upon benches made of what was called slabs that is, boards having the exterior or rounded part of the log on one side, as they were useless for any other purpose, these were converted into school benches and the rounded parts face down. Oh, what an awe fell over me when we were all seated and silence reigned around. The children were called up one by one to Aunt Delight, who sat in a low chair and required each as a preliminary to make his manners, consisting of a small sudden nod or jerk of the head. She then placed the spelling book, which was Dilworth's, before the pupil and with a buck-handled penknife pointed one by one to the letters of the alphabet, saying, what's that? If a child knew his letters, the what's that very soon ran on thus. What's that? A, snap, B, snap, C, snap, D, snap, E, etc. I looked upon these operations with intense curiosity and no small respect until my own turn came. I went up to the school mistress with some emotion. And when she said, rather spitefully, as I thought, make your obeisance, my little intellects all fled away and I did nothing. Having waited a second, gazing at me with indignation, she laid her hand on top of my head and gave it a jerk, which made my teeth clash. I believe I bit my tongue a little. At all events, my sense of dignity was offended, and when she pointed to A and asked me what it was, it swam before me dim and hazy and as big as a full moon. She repeated the question, but I was doggedly silent. Again, a third time she said, what's that? And I replied, why don't you tell me what it is? I didn't come here to learn you your letters. What immediately followed, I do not clearly remember. But one result is distinctly traced in my memory. In the evening of that eventful day, 
the schoolmistress paid my parents a visit and recounted to their astonished ears this my awful contempt of authority. My father, after hearing the story, got up and went away. But my mother, who was a careful disciplinarian, told me not to do it again. I always had a suspicion that both of them smiled on one side of their faces, even while they seemed to sympathize with the old petticoat and penknife pedagogue on the other. Two years later, I went to the winter school at the same place, kept by Lewis Umstead, a man who had a calling for plowing, mowing, carting manure, etc., in the summer, and for teaching school in the winter, with a talent for music in all seasons. All I remember of this person is his hand, which seemed to me as big as Goliath, and judging by the claps of thunder it made in my ears on one or two occasions, it was true. After I had left my native town for some 20 years, I returned and paid it a visit. Among the monuments that stood high in my memory was the West Lane Schoolhouse. Unconsciously carrying with me the measurement of childhood, I had supposed it to be at least 30 feet square. How it had dwindled when I came to estimate it by the new standards I had formed. It was in all things the same, yet wholly changed to me. What I had deemed a respectable edifice as now stood before me was only a weather-beaten little shed, which, upon being measured, was found to be less than 20 feet square. It happened to be a warm summer day, and I ventured to enter the place. I found a girl, some 18 years old, keeping the MAM school for about 20 scholars some of whom were studying Parley's geography. The mistress was the daughter of one of my schoolmates, and some of the boys and girls were grandchildren of the little brood which gathered under the wing of Aunt Delight when I was an ABC Darien. None of them, not even the schoolmistress, had ever heard of me. As to Peter Parley, whose geography they were learning, they supposed him some decrepit old gentleman hobbling around on a crutch a long way off, for whom, nevertheless, they had a certain affection inasmuch as he had made geography into a storybook. The frontispiece picture of the old fellow with his gouty foot in a chair threatening the boys as, that if they touched his tender toe, he would tell them no more stories, secured their respect, and placed him among the saints in the calendar of their young hearts. Well, thought I, if this goes on, I may yet rival Mother Goose. The next person, that we're going to hear from is Cyrus Northrup. Northrup uh, attended this school a little after Samuel Goodrich did. He, he was here in the late 1830s, early 1840s, uh, and he hated it. He thought this was an awful place. Uh, and he was a, you know, a, a person that could judge such things since um, he went on to become a noted professor at Yale University, and then he was wooed away to the University of Minnesota as its president. And he ran the University of Minnesota for over a quarter of a century, and he was so well liked in that state that they named a small city after him, a mountain called Northrop Mountain, and the 
huge auditorium on the main campus of the University of Minnesota is named Northrop Hall, or Northrop Auditorium. Uh, he, uh, after going to this school, went to a private school and then taught in Ridgefield. When he was 15 years old, he was a teacher at the center school. So he had a lot of teaching experience and he probably learned from here how not to do it. But we're gonna hear two selections from him. Uh, in one, he appears to be writing or speaking to a group probably of Ridgefielders and doesn't want to offend them. In the second one we will hear, he is speaking to his prep school where he really lays it out about how he felt about the West Lane School. So first we hear uh, the calmer um, evaluation. I began going to school when I was about four and a half years old. The schoolhouse of the district was located a mile from my home on a rocky and northern tract of land in the public highway. This track was surrounded by roads, one leading to Bedford, New York, over which the four horse mail coach passed on its way from Danbury to New York, another leading to New Canaan, Connecticut, while a crossroad united these two on a third side of the school lot and a fourth road branched off from the New Canaan Road at the side of the school lot and led to no particular place, disappearing finally in some huckleberry bushes. That's probably Silver Spring Road, which never really disappeared, but it may be for him. The schoolhouse was not painted. It had an entry in which the scholars hung their caps and cloaks in one main room for school purposes. In the middle of the room was a stove. Near it was a bench made of slab much thicker at one end than at the other, and on this the small children were seated. Running around three sides of the room were desks not separated but continuous at which the larger scholars sat with their backs toward the stove and small scholars and teachers. The latter's desk, the teacher's desk, was at the end of the room near the door. We're at the opposite side right now. In the entry was a pail of water and a dipper and a broom. I do not recall any other furniture. And now we'll hear what he said to the folks at Williston Academy. A little brown building in the highway where several roads met, upon lands too barren and rocky to produce anything else, was the ideal for old time schoolhouse. It contained but a single room, in the middle of which was an ungainly stove, and on either side of this, a row of infant boys and girls, too young for the mother to care for at home, seated on slab benches, waiting through the weary day for their chance to make one or two assaults upon the alphabet. And in the meantime, while alternately chilled and roasted, in imminent peril of the birch, should they venture to do anything else other than keep perfectly still. To relieve the painful nervousness of long enforced physical inaction by a hearty song would here be deemed a most unrighteous innovation. Around the sides of the room are older pupils, seated at what, by a kind of euphemism, are termed desks. These, with almost as many varieties of books as there are scholars, are seeking to work their way up the hill of science, while the teacher, worn out with his efforts to hear all the lessons and keep the younger children still, is unnaturally cross and severe. The day drags on its weary hours. 
teacher and scholar mutually, though perhaps unintentionally, annoying each other. Until the final, school is dismissed, comes as a welcome signal to both. Under such a system, here and there a scholar made evident progress, but the greater number did only what they were required to do, and that as a task, gaining little knowledge and less discipline, and both at a fearful cost to their moral nature. I do not remember having learned anything from my teachers. That doesn't mean that they were inferior teachers. I learned the lessons in the books and they tested my knowledge. It was not deemed important in those days to teach beyond what was written. I got a very good knowledge of geography, English, English grammar, arithmetic, reading, writing, and spelling. My favorite study was English grammar, now so much despised. I have never regretted the time I spent on that study, and I venture the opinion that if some people knew more about English grammar, and incidentally, the English language, they would think more highly of it. I used to carry my dinner in a little tin pail. It was quite small, and I remember that one day, as I was on my way to school, a carriage came along containing some strangers, three ladies and a gentleman, and as they saw me in my little pail, the little pail seemed to attract their attention, and they laughed. I never knew whether their laughter was in derision or admiration, but my little tin pail always contained an abundant and satisfactory dinner, and I was never hungry because the pail could not hold more. And as I say, Cyrus Northrup was a great educator uh, and a man highly respected. He didn't like this place. <laughs>